All right, welcome back to Crew Call with the Scooters. I am super excited today because I get to be with some really incredible strong women from Strong Women, Strong Girls. With me today is Natalie Martinez, who is the CEO. Um, and I'm with Kimmy Bastin, Managing Director of the Pittsburgh um, Regional Office, I guess I would say. And I just thank you so much for being here. I cannot wait to just ask a million questions about what you do. And, um, and it's really important, I think, because before we started to record, Natalie and I were talking about just girls and what they need right now during this time of pandemic, which I think sometimes we forget the kids are going through a lot of what we adults are going through. So thank you both for being with us. Um, and I'm gonna start, Natalie, talk to me about what Strong Women, Strong Girls does. Like what, what do you guys do? What are you doing in community? Why is this, and your nonprofit, 501c3, why is this important for Pittsburgh, for Boston, for the, for the US? Well, first of all, I wanna thank Flying Scooters for this opportunity to be with you today. So we really appreciate it. Absolutely. And um, so Strong Women, Strong Girls is a multi-generational mentoring organization. Um, our model is that girls in elementary school, grades three through five are mentored by college women who are themselves mentored by professional women. And we garner our professional women from local partnerships with corporations and, and other community businesses, okay. women who are interested in mentoring. So they come on as um, strong mentors and then they mentor the college women who mentor the girls. And our model is based on the six C's of positive youth development. The focus is on social emotional learning and building confidence and a sense of agency within the girls. And so we're really focused on building the next generation of strong women advocates and so forth. And, and we use a lot of our time and our talent to invest not only in the girls that are pre-adolescent and that are really needing us because their confidence peaks at the ages of nine through 11, which is where we focus, mm -hmm. and then drops by 30% after the age of 11. Um, but we also realize that working with college women and investing in them and helping to build leadership skills is another way to impact our world for women and girls. And then again, our multi-generational model is cyclical with having the professional women available to also mentor the, uh, the college women. Um, so for for the most part, that's what Strong Women, Strong Girls is about. We are just really charged up with really going into communities that are under-resourced, that, that don't necessarily have these types of skills, um, sorry, skills or programs available for their constituents um, to, to help those that are within the community. Um, anything I left out, Kimmy, that you can <laughs> chime in and help me out with? No, I think you covered it. Let me ask this, where did the, where did the idea of this start what was the what was the seed that said you know what we need to find we need to get into community help these girls but then also college women I think I would have benefited greatly from having a couple mentors um so talk to me about the inception yeah. of this um sure so Lindsay Hyde is our founder and she was a college student at Harvard University here in Massachusetts and really wanted to give back to the community as part of her educational experience. And what she noticed was that there was just nowhere for her to go and mentor or even to engage with girls specifically. And then knowing the research behind um, confidence and how it is, how it drops in adolescence, um, she started up a student group at Harvard with about six of her fellow classmates and reached out to a local school and was able to get, I think the number is 30 students um, for them to mentor and that was how it began. So it started out as a student run program out of Harvard in 2000 and then it grew quickly for over four years. And then um, we incorporated in Boston in 2004 and then brought on Pittsburgh in um, 2006. And so I think the history of how we moved to Pittsburgh is really important. So I'd love for me to jump in and, and tell a little bit about how we moved from Boston to Pittsburgh. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I know that uh, Lindsay Hyde, as Natalie mentioned, our founder, um, when she thought about bringing Strong Women, Strong Girls to Pittsburgh, uh, she thought about who could be a support network for the organization in Pittsburgh. And she had some connections at PNC Bank, um, obviously a regional bank um, that's you know growing and spreading as well. Um, and so she started by just speaking to a women's group um, at PNC Bank. Um, and a lot of the women from that group or ERG became our first advisory board here in Pittsburgh. Okay. Um, and one of the women who was part of that and knew Lindsay Hyde um, became our future board chair and um, has been on the board of directors ever since uh, they came here in 2006. Um, and so those professional women, I think, really helped to garner support and get the organization up and running. And then we started with our first college chapter at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, which is still a chapter today, along with five other universities in Pittsburgh, um, and then one elementary school out near um, Carnegie Mellon, and again, just grew from there to have uh, over 40 sites now in Pittsburgh. So China, which is in, incredible. Uh, it just absolutely incredible. <laughs> the thought of, I'm in school, I want to help, I'm going to go find a school, I'm going to get my friends, and we're going to do something. Talk to me about mentoring. I mean, what I mean, it sounds good, but what do you, what do you, what's the offering? Tell me about the girls. I mean, it's the critical time. I mean, you're right there, nine to 11, as you said, for these girls with their confidence and of course, college students, but talk to me about what do you provide? What do you provide? Sure. So again, we build uh, all of our lessons around the six C's of positive youth development and its connection, caring. Um, contribution, competence, um, character, and then confidence. And so the way that our day is structured, we have these, when we were in person, we have 90 minute lessons that take place once a week after school or depending on the, the site that we're connected with. Some of them are before school. And it consists of, a, it features a role model. So our college mentors come in and they meet with the girls, they get to know them. Um, they go through a series of activities to set up the day and then they go over this role model that they highlight in its base it's connected to one of the six C's of positive youth development and then there's an associated skill that they're learning as well. So once they review the role models bio and then they talk about the impact of that person's life, then the, then the girls, um, the elementary school girls are then able to reflect on how they see that within themselves. Mm -hmm. And then they, they have a series of activities that they do, usually um, active activities to get girls moving, but there's other things that they do to really help to bring the lesson home. And then there's another component of their relationship with the college mentors that's really wonderful, which is journaling. And it's an opportunity for the girls to, you know, write about their feelings and really build their relationship with their college mentors. And, you know, I tend to light up about the relationship that the girls have with the mentors because they, you know, these are not their teachers. They're not like their big sisters or their, their aunts or whatever. These are like the cool college kids that they get to build these relationships with. Right. kind of can see themselves um, in these in these girls. And so it's really, it's an awesome way for them to, again, to begin to focus on some skills that they'll need to carry them into the next phase of their elementary um, or their school education. And so that's really how the mentor relationship is built. Um, Kimmy, I'll let you tackle some of what we do with the strong leaders and the college mentors, because I think um, that piece is really important as well to how we uh, bring the mentoring relationship forward. And before you go there, let me ask this question. You know, I was going to ask a million questions. So how do I, is, sure, sure. If it's in the, so if I'm, if I'm a, if I'm a nine-year-old, which I'm pretty much the, the height of a nine-year-old. So I could, I could, <laughs> I could sneak in. Let me, let me ask this question. Um, if you're in that school, is it only if you're in that school or if I'm a girl that I'm like, I want to do this program, but I have, or is it just you're in these certain schools and then the, the girls can opt in to do this as a before school program or an after school program? That's exactly right. We have certain sites. So in Pittsburgh, there are 40. In Boston, there are 38. Okay. And so there are certain sites that we, that we partner with. Um, 
And so we're always trying to expand, but yeah. there, there are certain ways that we can move to additional sites and so forth. And, um, but that's exactly right. If any girl that's within that school that's or within that community center that's within that age group or that um, grade, three yeah. through five can come in as well and join our program. And if I've gone through the program, so I'm in Pittsburgh, I'm a nine-year-old, I go through the program at one of the sites, I go through, do I get a certificate or do I go on to a next month? Like, how do I, do I stay in it? How does that work? Yeah, so we, um, the, the girls do leave the program currently after fifth grade. Um, and we do actually give them certificates. We have a celebration every spring uh, oh. when our fifth graders get a little oh, yeah. gift from us. Um, but what we try to do is partner with other community organizations that are doing similar work um, in both cities. So speaking for Pittsburgh, we do have a partnership with Big Brothers Big Sisters where um, we provide them with um, at, at the very least a mailing list um, of our fifth grade girls um, so that they can reach out and offer their mentoring services. Um, in the future, you know, we hope to follow our girls even longer throughout their kind of journey and life. Um, but right now that's kind of the process that we have in place. And then how did, so that's for the girls and I'm learning mm -hmm. and I'm growing and I'm doing all of that. But then the college component is very interesting to me. Can you talk to me about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our college mentors, um, we, they're kind of the linchpin in the, in the model. Um, they mentor the girls but then they have uh, several different experiences of their own that they get to take part in. So they're part of a, first of all, they're part of a chapter on their college campuses that are um, student orgs within each university. Okay. So they have a community, I think our largest chapter in Pittsburgh has about a hundred mentors okay. um, and they have an executive board that leads the chapter. Um, so they have their own activities, they do their own fundraisers, all kinds of stuff on their campus. But then they also have the opportunity to get mentored, as we mentioned, by professional women who we call strong leaders. So they're matched one on one uh, with a strong leader for the course of the school year. Um, and that relationship, we really allow them to kind of customize. We provide guidance about what mentoring is and some suggestions to get conversations started. Um, but they really drive what they each want to get out of the relationship. So, you know, they can meet for coffee. We've had pairs go ax throwing um, or uh, strong leaders take their college women to a networking event at their company, all those kind of things to give them not only life, but also career and networking advice and guidance. Um, and then we also do group events with college and professional women together to network and also get professional development. Um, so yeah, definitely a very key program and creates Kind of that trickle down effect so the college women are getting even more skills that they can share with the girls it's, it's invaluable i mean to have those those connections because those are lifelong connections yes I think, you know that's even with the even with the girls you know if you've connected to some i think that is extremely important and you know you can be what you can see you know if you're all and i think that's really exactly important. so it's like if you're showing me something different than the four walls that are around me, you know, you, you can dream a little bigger and you can, you can strive a little higher for some of that stuff, which is I think it's, yeah. And I think that's one of the, you know, the major secret components of what we bring to the table with our mentoring model. And just to add to what Kimmy said around the college mentors and the professional women, they do get a lot of career advice and, and, and networking opportunities, but we are still doubling down on that confidence building in, in ways that you know, they can understand and see themselves thriving in the world through their professional woman that they're working with. But it, you know, the college mentor and the professional women are the easiest sort of bridge within our model in terms of like keeping track of our constituents throughout wow. their life. So we are looking at what happens with the girls actually after fifth grade and really like forward looking for the organization we're trying to build more um, resources in place so that we can either stay with the girls longer or perhaps partner with uh, other organizations like Kimmy said. But it's really important that, that you know, 
that those that are listening to us really understands that we are dead set on trying to make sure that we build that life cycle for girls and women. Because the again, back to the statistics and not to bore you, but your confidence, once it drops at age 11 or with you through adolescence, it doesn't come back until your mid thirties. At least that's what the research tells us. So imagine living your life through your adolescent years and then into high school and you may not even go to college or if you do go to college you're just still struggling with this inner um, lack of confidence and so we are seeing that that is what's actually tearing down the fiber of building new female leadership from communities um, that are under-resourced and so forth so it's just an amazing thing to be a part of as part of the you know the staff but also just to watch um, from the girls moving on and telling us their su success stories. And let me, because that, that's where I was going to ask. I want you to tell me a success story and you don't have to use real names, um, but I a little, I do want to talk about it because I think so much and, and I think everybody's gone through this. It doesn't matter what an incredible leader you all are. You always have a moment of hmm, not sure. And there's always influences kind of tearing down your self-confidence. I mean, it's very true. It, I mean, there are people that just try, I mean, it's like, you know, the trying to help each other, especially women, you know, building each other up. I'll just say from my experience, when I, when I came through agency and stuff, I had a lot of female bosses. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, they don't want you because yeah. you're taking the shine away from them. And it was like, no, we all need to shine. And also the imposter syndrome at times when you come into a room that you might not yes. have normally known to be, <laughs> right? It's like, you know, maybe your family hasn't had the access or the opportunity to walk through some of those rooms and you're finally there. All of a sudden it's like, well, you shouldn't be here. No, you should. So mm -hmm. that's what I love about this type of programming because just to have somebody go, go, do it. Yeah, we have, you can do it. I think it's so important because sometimes you just need a little pat on the back to go, no, oh, you're all right. Yeah, it's okay. You know, it's, and I think- and, and to be able to relate back to your story as well, like to be able to, to say that, you know, I've, I've been through it and I know exactly how you're feeling. And, you know, as it relates to the girls, we hear stories from like one of, one of the sites I observed a couple of weeks back or a few weeks back, one of the girls came into the session and was like, you know, I was bullied by this boy and, you know, the way I handled it was based on one of the, the role models that they were uh, featuring and I don't recall who it was at the time, but, you know, she really talks about how thankful she was to have that community of girls to talk to about what it was like to be bullied by a boy yeah. and how she stood up for herself and she felt confident standing up for herself. And then she was confident to go and tell her teachers about what happened, to, you know, to share what happened with her mom. Like those, those are some of the basic stories that we hear often. Um, we do have videos that we, you know, we get testimonials from girls that's featured on our website. So you can also see those yeah. things as well. But one of the things that I really love to hear about is we have a few um, alums. And when I mean alum alumni, um, girls who have been in the program, the actual girl program went on to college and then mentored, came back and mentored and then are now professional women that are part of our network as well. And we've even hired staff members that have been through those three different cycles within the organization. We have board members who've been through those cycles, but um, Kimmy, you have another story you wanna share with? with uh... Yeah, just from the uh, the strong leader mentoring perspective, we have um, a mentor mentor mentee pair. Um, I'm trying to think how many years ago this was. They they got together as a pair when the college woman was in tenth. Uh, she was a sophomore in college, yeah. not tenth grade. She was a sophomore in college, um, and <laughs> she's she's now three years out of college, and their relationship is still sustaining. Um, and they actually still both come to our events. Um, and they just love being together. They're in completely separate careers. The strong leader is in, she's a kitchen designer and um, the mentee is uh, in social work. Oh, wow. She actually became a Fulbright scholar and was in Columbia for a year recently. And through all of that, they've maintained their relationship. They Skype, they FaceTime. Um, and the mentee has just talked to us about how critical it's been for her to have somebody 
you know, who's not her mom um, that she can share things with that maybe you're, you, you can't always go to your family with um, and who isn't a professor and just provides that kind of external advice and experience. Um, and they just have, they have the best time together. And it's, it's so awesome to see those things kind of lasting um, after, you know, the, the confines of our program. That's like, that's the legacy of it. I, I, yeah, I think that's what's so incredible about it. Now we're in the middle of a pandemic. So, and a lot of this stuff <laughs> is always taking place together in rooms, in, in, uh, in person. How have you kind of changed your programming? I hate using the word pivoted, but pivoted mm -hmm. um, during this time. And what do people, how can people get involved? How can I get, how do I donate? How do I do, ta so talk to me first about the digital component because you guys did that for 2020. Uh, and how was that working and then how can we get involved? Yeah, so uh, we, as with everybody else, uh, had to shut down our in-person programming in March of 2020. Um, in April, our first offering that we were able to pull together was asynchronous online programming. Um, so videos about our role models, at home activities um, that girls could do with stuff they would probably have around the house. And so that was available really for all kids. We sent that out you know, to our whole community. Um, in the summer of 2020, we piloted in Pittsburgh um, a supply kit program where we piggybacked on um, some of our school lunch pickups that parents were doing for their kids and sent home some lessons from our curriculum and some supplies. Um, and girls loved it. They loved getting that kind of treat, that SWSG treat at home and kind of engaging that way. Um, and then fall of 2020, we pivoted completely to um, virtual programming. So we maintained our weekly schedule of sessions. Um, most of our sites stayed on. There were a few that didn't have the capacity to coordinate, you yeah. know, virtually. Yeah. Um, but mentors are meeting with girls every week and doing everything they would typically do um, for the most part over Zoom. And, you know, the only major change is we shortened from 90 to 60 minutes based on screen time recommendations. Um, but we've been able to keep, you know, uh, lessons about our role models. We've been able to incorporate a lot more videos that they can watch about the role models um, and activities that they can do at home, kind of no matter what they have access to in terms of supplies, they can participate. Right. Um, and then Natalie, I don't know if you want to talk at all about um, the kits that we were able to send home in the fall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So new this year, we were able to send home to each family that enrolled a supply kit that not only include um, some of the the basic supplies like construction paper, crayons, scissors, and so forth. But it also had um, a snack box, which was uh, 40 snacks within the box that they could bring to their Zoom session and share um, or have it while they were with their friends. And that was significant for our organization because it's the first time in the history of SWSG that we've been able to do that. It was our way of helping to address the food insecurity issue. But also when we are in person, we do provide snack as a part of our program. And so we didn't want to do away from do away with that. And thanks to the generosity of um, our donors, and we put out an email and a lot of people really responded to giving to that campaign and we were able to cover the costs for um, the fall semester, but um, for the spring, we, we may have to do the same type of drive because it wasn't budgeted for the organization. So you asked how people could get involved. They can absolutely reach out to us and make a donation through our website. But it's really important that we continue to meet the needs of the girls in the place that they're in. We're seeing so much how families are struggling and they're struggling not only just to get their kids online for school, but even more so for programs like ours. And what we address, and I know we talked about this earlier when we first signed on, um, what we're addressing is that mental health component. It's that part of knowing that, you know, the there's a rise in suicide ideation with our with our girls or with our women and girls. Um, there's a rise in domestic violence in homes, especially in under-resourced communities. So offering this place where you can come and have a snack and talk to your friends and, and engage in our program is really meeting the needs during the pandemic. So we would appreciate any support that anyone can offer. Um, if you want to get involved, there's a way to sign up through our link on our website, and we could certainly put you in in um, in touch with you know volunteering. Um, but of course, we would welcome any donations that are available. 
And people can donate right through your website, which is, go ahead and say it. It's um, swsg.org. <laughs> Great. Yes, <laughs> pretty easy, swsg.org. <laughs> That's very, very easy uh, to remember, but we'll put that in, in a link um, when we send this out as well. And I just thank you so much. I think it's extremely important, the work that you're doing. And um, there's a lot of healing in that. And I think that's a part of this when you talk about domestic violence, child abuse during this time, I, the statistics, you know, and just having it. It's incredible. Wow, it's horrific. I mean, it's horrific. Even the, I'm gonna dive, uh, go off on a little bit. It, the, the waitress down in Florida, I think, right? With the little boy who had been, who was being abused, I think hit the news in the last couple of weeks. It's just, you think about those things and programs like this are so important because you're building a community outside of the walls that they know. And that is extremely, extremely important for offering hope with, you know, with strength. And I think that's beautiful. So thank you both, Natalie and Kimmy, so much uh, today for what for being with me, but also for the work that you're doing. And um, yeah, thanks so much for hanging out with me. <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you. Well, for thank you for this you. wonderful opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Really <laughs> thank you so much. And we'll see you soon. Great. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care.